Stones have been used from time immemorial for numerous purposes by almost every race of mankind. Nearly 50,000 curious constructions in stone command the landscape of over a dozen countries, stretching from Western Europe to Asia. More than 900 are found in the British Isles alone. Many seem at first glance to have been shaped by some accident of nature, but all were fashioned by prehistoric man as purposefully as the cathedrals of later era. The ways in which stones have been utilized are sometimes so peculiar that their discovery in certain associations have been taken as indicative of the existence of a singular culture in which they played an integral part. For years, conjecture and controversy have swirled around the questions. When did man start to put up megaliths, as stone monuments are called, in the first place? And what was their purpose? in Tibet, from Durab in Iran, to Karnak in Brittany, and Avebury in England, are some thousands of miles. Yet the similarity these stone monuments show that they were erected by one and the same people. Some of the greatest of these stone structures are to be found in the territory of Jordan in the Middle East. The question of great interest is the identity of these people who left these great stones as a mark of their passing. I am E. Raymond Capt, biblical archaeologist and historian. I have designed this film to present the evidence that these people were the descendants of Shem, the father of the children of Heber, who migrated westward after the flood, sometime after 3144 BC. And among them were the Hebrew Phoenicians and the Hebrew Israelites. The word megalithic comes from the Greek megas, meaning great, and the word lithos, a stone. Taken together, megalithic simply means a great stone. Megalithic monuments can be divided roughly into three classes. Class one, menhirs, a Celtic word meaning high stone. That is a single stone slab set upright, and is usually commemorative of some great event or personage. Class two, dolmen. This is also a Celtic word meaning table stone. That is a stone slab set table-wise on three or more uprights. An example of this is a Kitts Cody house in Kent in England. These dolmen were buried places of chieftains or war leaders, and the tomb sites were then surrounded by earthen banks, which gradually eroded away through the passage of time, leaving only the three or more standing stones. Class three, cromlech, another Celtic word meaning a stone circle, sometimes enclosing a dolmen, and sometimes enclosing a barrel. Barrels are usually long earthen mounds, inside which are tombs of important personages or chieftains. These stones commemorate a treaty between Canaanite tribes at the high place of Tel Giza in Israel, dated to the 2nd millennium BC. 
Stones are sometimes carved into wall plaques such as this, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal fighting a lion single-handed. And these stone carved wall plaques decorate the processional stairway of King Apollana's palace in the city of Persepolis. Above is a procession of palace guards. These are the king's special guards, composed of both Medes and Persians, facing each other in parade order. The Medes wear helmets, and the Persians the cylindrical tiaras. Stones often marked grave sites, or were even erected in worship as idols, such as these at Biblos in Lebanon. Far to the northwest of Lebanon, in Karnak in Brittany, is a unique collection of stones. Early arrivals in this part of Europe, at about the time of Abraham, that is, about 1900 BC, set in line long rows of megalithic structures in parallel rows two miles long, laid in an east-west direction. My height is six foot, so you can judge the height of this stone. There are about 13 rows with many stones missing, but lined up as they are toward the rising sun. They must have indicated some sort of sun worship. Possibly they offered prayers and chanting to some unknown deity at the arrival of another dawn. There is a similar alignment of standing stones at Dol Ring in Tibet like that of Karnak. Here are two ceremonial locations laid out in the same way but separated by 5,000 miles. Surely there must be a connective thought. Far to the north of Karnak are the windswept Orkney Islands. Fierce gales from the Atlantic have denuded the islands of any woodlands or forests for building purposes. Thus all the dwellings had to be built of stone. Five thousand years ago a hardy race of fishers and farmers built this village of Scarabray. Of the dwellings the best preserved is this one. Central to each house was a fireplace with a fire in this cool latitude was never allowed to go out. All the beds and houses were found to be aligned on midsummer sunrise and sunset. The inhabitants of Scarabray grew barley and wheat, but their main food supply came from the sea, seal, cod, and whale. Evidence for the latter came from whale bone tools found in some of the houses. Although the dwellings provided privacy, they were all linked together by passages, which were roofed over with stone slabs, the cracks being filled in with turf and village refuge to keep out the icy wind. Each house had cupboards recessed into the walls, and some houses had drains running beneath the floor. One house had this modern-style dresser, on which a pot was found still standing in this place after 2,000 years. Scarab Bray was abandoned at about 2450 B.C. when a great gale covered it over with sand. And only in 1867 did another gale expose it again. Near to Scarab Bray is another megalithic structure. Constructed around 3600 B.C., this is Maze Howe, seen from the air. The rays of the sun shone down through the entrance passage just as the sun set. This Maze Howe was aligned to mark the completion of one season and the start of another. Two and a half thousand years later, Viking explorers found Maze Howe 
a convenient shelter from the northern gales and left their mark in the shape of graffiti, usually in the shape of Viking longships. But sometimes they made uncomplimentary remarks about other Vikings. Standing stark and alone in the Orkney Islands are the monoliths of Stennis. Ruined, many of its stones removed, its ditch half filled up. This ring of stones still gives a sense of prehistory. It is dated to about 2960 BC and was constructed as a place of assembly. It has been calculated that 50 people working with only antler picks and working all day long would have taken at least six months to build the ditch alone. The Stennis stone circle originally consisted of 12 stones set along the inner edge of a rock-cut ditch, which is found to contain the bones of wolves, oxen, and sheep. Close to Stennis is the ring of Brudgar beside Loch Hara. It is one of the most elegant stone circles in the British Isles. Although it has been partly demolished, the height of the stones and the graceful western arc of the circle gives a vivid impression of the strength and authority of the ring. The local flagstones split naturally into even tapering planks of stone, ideal for the columns of a stone circle, which was laid out exactly on a north-south axis. There is no known date for the ring of Brodgar, but stone axes date it to about 2500 B.C. As with many other stone monuments, one can find astronomical alignments with the sun and moon and sometimes with the stars. In order to determine an alignment, one only needs a fixed point at which to stand, usually marked by a standing stone, and another fixed point, preferably at a considerable distance in order to increase accuracy, then to a point on the horizon. It can even be a Cornish mine shaft. Some of the alignments, in particular concerning the moon, could only be fixed by observations that took many years to confirm. One of the alignments at Callanish, another Scottish group of monoliths, points to the exact position where the first magnitude star capella rose in about 1800 BC. Another row of stones is lined up with the constellation in the Pleiades in about 1500 B.C. From their authoritative book, Callanish, Helmut Schultz, he wrote, During the Stone Age and the early Bronze Age, from around 3000 to 1500 B.C., people came from the south of Europe in order to settle in various places in the Hebrides. No one can be sure today where they came from or for what reason they undertook their long migration. But it appears that the starting point was somewhere in the eastern Mediterranean area, and they followed two identifiable routes via northern Europe to Denmark, Germany, the Baltic Sea, and Scandinavia, and the other via Malta, Spain, Ireland, and Scotland. These two groups moved at approximately the same period of time. That it is logical to assume that they were of the same race or group of people. Some of Britain's stone circles are sometimes mistakenly called Druid circles. Druids, however, did not build them, although sometimes they were used by them. Druid ceremonies were performed in groves or woods and they were very knowledgeable in the fields of medicine, astronomy, and geography. It took 20 years of study to become a Druid priest. They were able to give judicial judgments, and they could interpret dreams, their knowledge being passed on by the spoken word only. Indeed, a parallel could be very well drawn between the official duties of the high priests of Old Testament times and that of the Bronze Age Druidical priesthood. One can assume that as in the days of the Hebrew people in the Old Testament times, there was considerable class distinction between the astronomer priests and the ordinary people. 
Only the priests had the knowledge of the astronomical alignments and the rituals. Their power was considerable, for they could predict eclipses. The Windmill Hill people were the first of the Neolithic builders to enter the British Isles around 2800 BC. The strategy of forming their communities on hilltops had a twofold advantage. They could see the enemy as they advanced, the enemy having the disadvantage of attacking uphill. And in any case, hilltops are usually drier than the lower areas. Their tombs contained more than skeletons. They were flint arrowheads with razor-sharp edges, spearheads, swords, and daggers of ceremonial type, indicating a belief in an afterlife. And piles of animal bones found in one tomb may have been the remains of ceremonial feasting, indicating the passing of souls and may have been the occasion for rejoicing rather than sorrow. The earlier Bronze Age, between 1650 and 1200 BC, saw the influx of the Beaker people, so named because they are used and frequently buried their dead with beaker-shaped containers and reddish-brown drinking cups in the graves. The open countryside of Wiltshire in southern England appears to have been an attraction for the bigger people and those of the Neolithic nobility who desired to be interred in the wide open spaces of the downland of Salisbury Plain where there's no sound but the wind over the grass and the song of the lark. From the air, their burial places resemble a line of molehills, perhaps constructed to follow the track of a ley line. and another type of burial place. The Nimsfield Long Barrel in Gloucestershire A sign states, a near leg barrel of the Severn Coswell Group, much disturbed by plowing and 20th century excavators, it has been re-excavated and consolidated. It was built around 2800 BC and probably remained in use for burial and ritual purposes for many centuries. The bones of some 13 people were found in the chambers. Strangely enough, there appears to be a marked difference in skull shape between those buried in the long barrels and those entered in the circular type of tumuli. This difference in skull shape would at first glance appear to indicate a different racial origin. However, Sir Arthur Keith, an ethnologist of international repute, wrote, I never lose an opportunity of correcting the mistaken idea that these skull shapes indicate a racial difference. There is no racial difference between the so-called Saxon skull found in a grave in Kent in southern England and the so-called Celtic skull found in a tumulus in Connemara, Ireland. These people were called by different names, but were originally all one people. They might have lived in the West Kennet Long Barrel, which was first constructed in about 3250 BC and was in use down to 2000 BC. The remains of 46 people were found in it, 12 of whom were children. They must have been a dynasty of aristocrats to have earned a place in this very special burial ground. Who they were, we will never know. In complete contrast to the West Kennet Long Barrel is the grandeur of Abury, more dramatic, some may say, even than Stonehenge. There seems to have been a desire in the minds of the early inhabitants of the British Isles to pay homage to some real or imagined deity of the wide open spaces. It may have been the vast circle of the wide horizon, the wind over the grass, the towering cumulus clouds contrasting with the littleness of humanity, which instilled into the people some sense of awe, so much so 
they felt they should have some central location in which to make known their appreciation of the solitude to the unknown God. Built in late Neolithic times, about 2500 BC, Avebury involved very large numbers of people. The sanctity and prestige of Avebury may have drawn many people to it, some of whom became a suitable workforce, all of which increased the flow of trade. Even today, Avebury draws thousands of visitors a year to view this ancient structure. At the base of a stone at Avebury was discovered a grave containing the skeleton of a young man and a decorated pot of the bigger period, dated to about 2000 BC. The great circle of stones at Avebury covers an area of 28 and a half acres. It's nearly a mile in circumference. The main road to the village bisects the circle. There is a great ditch encircling the site, which must have been an enormous undertaking, as crypt as they were with only bone tools. Today, the ditch is sealed up to about half its former depth. Originally, the sides were sheer, thus to the careless worker there would have been a 30-foot drop in the rough and jagged chalk at the bottom. At the bottom of the ditch, many broken or worn antler picks, shoulder blade shovels, and antler rakes were found as well as Windmill Hill Pottery. The latter probably held the workers' lunch. At Abury's northern entrance is a large sarsen stone called the Diamond. It is nearly 15 feet high and is wide across the middle. It weighs about 40 tons. It was dragged here from the surrounding hills on wooden rollers and according to local folklore, crosses the road to the village as a church clock strikes midnight on Midsummer Eve, looking for its lost partner which is missing from the circle. Wrote William Stukeley, This stupendous fabric, which for some thousands of years has braved the continuous assaults of weather, has fallen a sacrifice to the wretched ignorance and avarice of these local people who desired a cheap an easy source of building stone. To the south of Abury is the largest man-made mound in Europe, Silbury Hill. Its purpose is unknown, but its method of construction employing several layers like sections in a cake in diminishing sizes is very similar to the oldest of Egypt's experimental pyramids at Saqqara. Approximately 700 men would have been employed in the building of Silbury Hill, taking about 10 years to accomplish it. The figure of eight and three quarter million cubic feet moved is equal to the cubic volume of the pyramid built by the Pharaoh Mykernes at approximately the same period of time. The purpose of Silbury Hill remains a mystery, but archeologists believe it to have been a burial mound. If there is a burial mound, it must be offset from the center, which has already been explored with no result. Stonehenge is the most important monument dating from prehistoric times in the whole of the British Isles. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the world. At the height of its glory, between 2000 and 1700 BC, it must have been a wonderful sight, yet Greek and Roman writers, perhaps used to the order and sophistication of Roman Athens, hardly mentions it, or when they did, described it as a heathen temple. But to raise massive blocks of stone, weighing up to 50 tons from ground level, up to 15 or 20 feet, is not the work of primitive people. The building of Stonehenge covers a period of about 20 centuries, between 3200 BC and 1100. Starting from a simple bank and ditch 
with a diameter of 360 feet. Slightly inset from the ditch was dug a series of holes called Aubrey holes, named after their discoverer. This initial structure was in use for about 500 years, but then the place fell into disuse and reverted to its natural state. But in 2100 BC, the site came to life again. For about eight blue stones, weighing about four tons each, were brought to Stonehenge from the Presidium Mountains in South Wales to be set up in the center of the site in a double circle. It was during this abandoned period of Stonehenge's existence that the great pyramid building period began in Egypt. Then there came sudden new life and purpose to Stonehenge. Archaeologists and students have found some unexpected parallels between the design of the Great Pyramid of Giza and the alignments of Stonehenge, indicating a possible interchange of ideas between two widely separated locations. Stage one in the construction of Stonehenge consisted of moving the sarsens forward on rollers, and they were positioned correctly beside the hole dug for it. Then a start was made in levering it upright. Stage two consisted of building a pile of timbers against which the sarsen is levered further upright. Stage three, a shear legs is erected, supports are placed in position, and a rope is attached to the top of the sarsen. It is then pulled up into a vertical position. Stage four, stay lines are attached to the top to prevent the sarsen from topping over, and it is now in the correct position while a team of workers pack the sides of the hole with stones and rocks. At about 2000 BC, the next stage in the erection of this unique monument started. Some advanced mind visualized a great plan, a huge circle of massive vertical stones surmounted by a continuous line of lintels. All of these great blocks of stone weighing many tons were dragged overland from the Marlboro Downs, a distance of some 18 miles. Inside this circle of monoliths, the Wessex people, for it was within their mind that this grandiose scheme for a newer and greater Stonehenge formulated. They erected again in horseshoe plan five great arches, 22 feet in height called trilithons, composed of two verticals surmounted by a crossways lintel. The axis of this creation was aligned on midsummer sunrise and was marked externally by the great marker stone called the heel stone, over which on that day the sun rose. Stonehenge, the accumulation of a long megalithic trail stretching from the Middle East across Asia Minor and Europe, exhibits refinements which cannot be found anywhere else in the Northern Hemisphere. As in carpentry, mortise and tenon joints were used in placing the 50-ton lintels atop the upright sergeants. And the ends were tongued and grooved to slot into each other. Heavy stone hammers were used to pound the lintels into a slight curve and follow the circle plan. And their sides were so shaped that they were larger at the top in the bottom, so as to be more artistically pleasing to the eye. The blue stones were quarried from the Priscillium Hills in South Wales and were dragged on rollers down to the nearest water, this being the Bristol Channel. Here they were lashed to rafts, floated around the coast, then across the estuary of the River Severn and up the River Avon to an offloading point on the River Wiley. Then again across country to the Salisbury Avon to Amesbury. Then finally again on rollers across the country to Stonehenge. The total transit time being about one year. Much thought has been given by historians and archeologists as the exact purpose to which Stonehenge was put. In 1963, a British astronomer, Gerald Hawkins, 
speculated that Stonehenge might have served as an astronomical instrument and calculated compass directions of stars and constellations in over 170 sets of stones as the star grouping would have been in 1500 BC. Although he fed the results into a computer, he found no correlation with any of the stars, but there was clearly several alignments with the sun and moon. Scientists and scholars in our day have far too often assumed that little, if anything, was known in early days about true astronomical factors, such as the actual length of the solar year. Yet, in the British Isles, we find hundreds of ancient stone structures indicating the builders to have been in possession of such astronomical knowledge. In France, England, Ireland, and Scotland, numerous complexes of standing stones are now acknowledged to have been orientated toward not only the summer and winter solstices and equinox, but also toward the equivalent positions of the moon. Like giant sundials, these stones mark the seasons rather than the hours. In Oxfordshire in southern England are the Royal Wright stones sometimes called Little Stonehenge. It is a perfect circle of about 70 stones called the King's Men, with a diameter of about 100 feet. This is about the same as the Sarsen Stone Circle at Stonehenge. Just outside the ring to the northeast is a single min here called King's Stone. It has been as deformed by people as by weather. It was apparently a siding stone, but to what alignment has not been determined. In the valley of the River Boyne in southern Ireland is the finest example of the passage grave system in all of Western Europe. It is dated to about 3000 BC and thus predates not only Stonehenge but also the pyramids of Egypt. The entrance passage is very narrow as seen in this 17th century drawing. The passage is 62 feet long and at one end a small opening allows the rays of the rising sun to cross the stone floor as far as the Marian burial chamber, which becomes fully illuminated for about 17 minutes on the shortest day of the year, the 21st of December. The roofing is a fine example of corbeling and is composed of heavy flat slabs of granite. The famous entry stone is decorated with concentric circles and maze markings and appears to have had special mystical significance for the builders. Another passage grave is located a few miles from Newgrange at Nauf. This impressive site was constructed around 2500 BC, several centuries before the earliest astronomical observations in the Near East even before the founding of the first Egyptian dynasty in 3100 BC. The principal site consists of a round mound about 100 yards in diameter. This was constructed in a composite manner by alternating layers of redeposited sod, boulder clay, stone, shale, and other materials. The opening of the passage grave brought something new to the archaeologists. It was found that the huge boulders forming the sides of the passage had carvings and decorations on them, unlike any found anywhere else in the world. They are similar to the carvings on the stones circling the mound itself. They bore on their outer face spirals, broken circles, maze, and serpent decorations, all important factors in helping to ascertain the age of the tomb. The decorations, the meanings of them, elude modern scholars are though thought to have been fashioned by hammer and chisel before the megaliths were set in place. One of the more pressing needs of the Neolithic people was for vessels in which to cook and store food and for dishes and cups. The earliest ones were made by hand from the local clay and were then fired in an open kiln. Later a simple wheel was devised which helped to speed up production and also to give uniformity. 
In the far southwest of England, in the county of Cornwall, are the Merry Maidens, a precise circle of 19 evenly spaced stones. The Merry Maidens in local folklore are named after 19 local girls who dared to go out dancing on a Sabbath day and were immediately turned into stone for their sin. The Merry Maiden Circle is also the conjunction of several ley lines. The basic concept behind the idea of ley lines is that all ancient sites were deliberately placed in the landscape to form part of the complex network of interlocking straight lines. It is an established fact that many megalithic sites do appear to fall into straight lines across country, often across hundreds of miles. The unanswered question is, was this by chance, or was this done as part of a purpose-built, carefully thought-out plan, other than required for obvious astronomical purposes? Astronomers have discovered several alignments from the Mary Maiden stones with various stars marking sunset and sunrise. One line is orientated toward the first magnitude star, Capella, heralding the February sunrise. Another line marks the May and August sunset positions. In far west Cornwall is one of the most unusual structures made by the Megalithic people, called in the ancient Cornish tongue, Minato. It was first recorded in the 18th century as having healing properties and people who were afflicted with various rheumatic diseases used to visit the site and attempt to crawl through the opening in the stone. If they succeeded in doing so, probably convinced themselves that after all, they couldn't be as ill as they and their relatives had imagined. These mysterious signs of a bygone age bring us back to the question, just who were these megalithic people who constructed these imposing stone monuments and buried their dead in long barrels and passage graves. And where did the culture they brought with them originate? Whoever they were, they seemed to have been a remarkable, prosperous people, earning their living from the soil without too much strain. If a house burned down, a new one could be put up with the help of a friendly neighbor. If crops failed, wild game was always within easy reach, they often lived together in small communities in huts made from wattle, woven branches plastered with mud, and with reeds for thatching the roofing. They had ample time left over to construct stone monuments and to take part in the various ceremonies around them. According to Sir Norman Lockyer, British megalithic culture can be traced back to the diffusion of Semitic people from the Eastern Mediterranean, who migrated through Europe to the British Isles, accompanied by an astronomer priesthood, their later descendants being known as Druids. Sir Norman's conclusions are not without visible evidence in the form of a stone trail from Palestine westward in the form of cromlechs, stone circles, and dolmens to suggest, apart from an occasional isolated men here, that all these stone monuments were erected by a single group of people. It is thought unlikely that this stone building culture would have spread from one group to another over such vast distances. It is more likely that the theme of monument building was inherent within a one original single group. However, there appears to be some uncertainty as to the origins of these megalithic builders but there are clues in the Old Testament. Menhirs, dolmen, stone circles, and pillars are all mentioned in connection with the Hebrew people of the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, Jacob is recorded as setting up a pillar and then consecrating it by pouring oil over it, saying, And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. Again, in solemn covenant with his father-in-law, Laban, he took a stone and set it up for a pillar. The 
A stone cairn is indicated in Genesis chapter 31. For Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones and make a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. Here we see that Jacob constructed two of the most common types of ancient monuments, single stone of witness and a cairn or a collection of stones by a multitude of witnesses. Families who wish to give thanks or ask for God's blessing on their personal affairs would provide animals to be slaughtered upon the altar. A meal of boiled meat was then prepared in which the priest shared, the fat part being put aside, later to be burned on the altar to complete the ritual. Altars such as this have been found at Megiddo in northern Israel's territory. One of the first mentions of stone circles takes us back to the time of Joshua, the successor to Moses. When Israel came to cross the river Jordan, the Ark of the Covenant preceded them. On crossing, Joshua then instructed the people to erect a circle of stones as a commemorative marker at their crossing point, Gilgal, somewhere near here. The word means a circle. In the first book of Samuel, chapter 7, it is recorded that Samuel set up a stone of witness. And Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer Shin. Hitherto has the Lord helped us. And in the second book of Samuel, Absalom also set up a pillar of witness and was later buried beneath a cairn. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar and he called the pillar after his own name. In one of the most violent acts performed by Israel as they invaded the land of Canaan was the utter destruction of Achan and his entire family, even all his cattle and possessions, for disobeying Joshua's orders. Joshua then ordered them to be buried beneath a large cairn of stones, possibly sealed all around with rocks and earth. On Mount Ebal in Palestine, there is a deviation from the traditional standing stone or circle Recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, Israel is instructed to create a minhir on which rough surface plaster is to be added in order to furnish a flat surface on which the tablets of the law are to be engraved. On another hilltop, Mount Gezerim, Sir Henry Morton Stanley, the famous British explorer, found a stone circle that he described as being the oldest in Palestine and which he stated paralleled the so-called Druid circles of Britain. He added, these stone circles were evidently of great religious significance. For it was in a form such as a circle on Mount Jezum that the semi-mystic character Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, came to meet Abraham with gifts of wine and bread. It is worthy of note that the famous English Antiquarian William Stuckley asserts that Druidism was introduced in the British Isles from the lands of the Bible about the time of Abraham, 1900 B.C. approximately. Stuckley may have been referring to the Welsh Triad number 4 of the Chronicles of Wales, which states, The first of the three chieftains who established the colony was Hugh the Mighty, who arrived with the original settlers. They came over from the hazy sea, probably the English Channel, from the summer country, which is called Defrobani, that is, where the city of Constantinople now stands. This city is now Istanbul. Hugh the Mighty is Hugh Godarn Hysion, credited with the establishment of Druism in Britain about 1800 B.C. Tradition further identifies him as an immediate descendant of Abraham. If this be true, this would account for his leadership being the son or grandson of such an illustrious Bible character. Could it be that his name, Hyacinth, is derived from Isaacson? If so, then this coming to Britain would be the first recorded instance of the fulfillment of the prophecy found in Genesis chapter 28, that the seed of Abraham would spread abroad to the four points of the compass. Another noted British scholar, Charles Holbert, Wrote, so near is the resemblance between the Druidic religion of Britain and the patriarchal religion of the Hebrews that we do not hesitate to pronounce their origin the same. 
All the Celtic Druids who first arrived in the British Isles brought a debased form of faith long after their ancestors hadn't performed idolatrous ceremonies to the stars, the elements, the hills and trees. They never completely forsook the worship of the supreme God of all nature. The conclusion that can be drawn from all the evidence is that the early Megalithic builders who erected the great stone monuments were Hebrews themselves, or the progenitors of the Hebrews. They were the building race of the Bible, fathered by Shem. They built the great pyramid of Egypt, and down through the ages, groups of these people were continually moving westward, finally arriving in the British Isles. They brought with them the knowledge, ability, creativity, and skills that enabled them to construct Stonehenge. Along the routes of the Begley builders are to be found ancient tombstones erected by their descendants, Celtic and Scythian Hebrew Israelites. One tombstone reads, This is the tombstone of Buki, the son of Itchak, the priest. May his rest be in Eden at the time of the salvation of Israel in the year 702 of the years of our exile. Another reads, I am Jehudi, the son of Moses the son of Jehudi the Mighty, a man of the tribe of Napoli, which was carried away captive with the other tribes of Israel by Shalomnezer from Samaria during the reign of Hosea, the king of Israel. They were carried to Hela, to Gozan, and Chersonius. The latter place is the Crimea. All this confirms the evidence that the Hebrew Israelite people who were taken captive to the Gozan, Hela, and Hobar area as recorded in the Book of Kings, also adds that they finally arrived in the area of the Crimea after having migrated westward from the place of captivity in Assyria. Another tombstone reads, To the faithful in Israel, Abraham Marshinsha of Kerch, in the year of our exile, 1682, from the sons of Reuben and Gad in the half-tribe of Manasseh, were exiled to Hela and Gozan by Telak Pleaser and were permitted to settle there, and from which place they have been scattered throughout the entire coast, even as far as China. This again correlates the archaeological record of the wanderings of the Saka branch of Israel eastward. The dating of 1682 must refer to the founding of the nation of Israel at the time of the Exodus in 1453 B.C which would fix the date of the tombstone at about 130 A.D. To summarize, there are good reasons for believing that these time-defying megalithic monuments follow the westward trail of the people whose god was the god of Shem, Melchizedek, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The evidence supports the scriptural inference that of the selected line of Shem, the Hebrews in particular, had been chosen to serve in the capacity of pioneers of civilization, to blaze a trail to the westward lands where, in the fullness of time, an important section of the race was to grow in full stature, to be used as a vehicle whereby progress and enlightenment would be radiated to the world at large. In later centuries, their offspring, the Celtic people, in contingents, small and great, followed from time to time in their wake to find that their Hebrew kinsmen ancestors had already paved the way for the large-scale immigration that was to continue for more than a thousand years, bringing into the British Isles wave after wave of invaders, Angles, Saxons, Jews, Danes, Vikings, and lastly, Normans, all now known to have been of the same basic racial stock. This race of people had been admonished in the scriptures to remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. <laughs>